And you guys are good whenever. Welcome everyone to the Redesigning History Gateway Courses Workshop. My name is Susanna McGowan. I'm a gardener a fellow with the Gardner Institute, and my day job is the Associate Director for Curriculum Design at Georgetown University. We're going to do a brief round of introductions of all of our colleagues who are joining us for the call. I'm going to start with Drew Koch from the Gardner Institute. Thanks so much, Susanna. Yeah. There we go. Ladies and gents, it's good to be with you. Uh, I'm President Chief Operating Officer at the Gardner Institute. I'll be sharing a little more later, so I'll keep it short and sweet and turn it back to Dr. McGowan now. Let me um, take a step back and just say thank you again for joining us today for this conference call and, and webinar. Um, this is our agenda for today's workshop. We're going to do the introductions and then Drew Koch and Ed Ayers will discuss the charge and our collective purpose for our time together today. Then we're going to talk about some of our course design principles that we uh, that provide a foundation for a lot of our work at the Gardner Institute. We're going to then experiment with small breakout rooms or small group work, which we like to do when we're all together at our conferences, but today we're going to um, do it in Zoom. So I'm going to ask in advance for patience and um, your patience in trying this out with us as we're all in this new virtual space of trying to simulate um, being together and sharing really good ideas. And then we'll come back together and um, discuss what we discussed in the breakout rooms and how they operated and hopefully we'll make it back from the breakout rooms and then we'll um, talk about our next steps. So again, my name is Susanna McGowan and we heard a little bit from Drew and then I'd like to introduce my other colleagues, Steph and Peter. Stephanie? Sure, good afternoon everyone or I guess good morning if you're in another time zone. Nice to see everyone's name and recognize quite a few on the list. I work at the Gardner Institute and I'm the Associate Vice President for Teaching, Learning, and Evidence-Based Practices. And what that means is I get to work with a lot of faculty who are going through the process of course redesign. And it's an honor and a privilege to have the opportunity to be here with you all and working with a wonderful group uh, that we've been collaborating with for a while. And we've certainly been looking forward to this. There's a lot of anticipation about the use of the digital tools that we'll talk about today. So I look forward to seeing and hearing and learning from each of you and with you through this process. Thanks everyone. Hi everybody, I'm Peter Felton. I am a Gardner Institute fellow like Susanna. And in my alter ego, um, I'm a professor of history and assistant provost for teaching and learning at Elon University in North Carolina. Glad to be here. Um, Peter, I really appreciate how you match your photo and the slides. And <laughs> I never <laughs> leave this one space. <laughs> so it's yeah. really good social distancing right here. So. What Susanna is trying to say is that some of us look nothing like our photo because we're <laughs> <laughs> good to us. <laughs> That's right, Steph. Um, and as, as Steph said, we're thrilled to have the opportunity to partner with the New American Institute History, the, I'm sorry, New American History Project, um, soon to be an institute, maybe in the future, we don't know. But um, so I'd like to uh, have our colleagues uh, present themselves and thank you again for uh, this wonderful opportunity to join forces and think about redesigning history with these fantastic set of tools. Ed, would you like to start? 
Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate the kind of words. I'm afraid I come the farthest from matching my image right now. Uh, I looked uh, kind of put together with a tie and everything back in the day, but that was a while back. Um, I'm executive director of New American History. I'm a history professor and president emeritus at the University of Richmond. And uh, I can't tell you how excited we are to have a chance to uh, participate in this important work. Uh, it's interesting to have been a teacher and then to think about how you might actually talk about it instead of just doing it. <laughs> so it's been an exciting enterprise. So thanks for joining us today. Annie? I call it Annie. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You're muted, Annie. Annie. Annie, you're on mute. Is that better? There you go. Thank you for being in the house doing Zooms all day. <laughs> better for Apologies. So I'm Annie Evans, and I am uh, had the pleasure of working with Ed and Tony Field at New American History. My role is to create learning resources, primarily for K-12 teachers, and I work with pre-service teachers as well. And I'm really looking forward to learning with and from you today. I'm Tony Field um, with a violin lesson happening behind me in another room. So I'll keep my introduction short. <laughs> I'm the editor of Bonk, which is one of New American History's flagship projects. Um, maybe we can talk more about Bonk if time permits later on in the session. Wonderful. And we'll have an opportunity to introduce each other, um, everybody present, when we break out into the small groups. So we look forward to um, hearing how everybody's doing and where you're calling in from. So at this point, we're going to talk about our collective purpose and being here framed by Drew and Ed, or Ed and Drew, or simultaneously. Well, I'll kick this one off, Susanna. And I want to chime in and uh, echo Ed's sentiments and actually all my colleagues' sentiments, which is just how excited we are to be here. Um, this is a virtual workshop about five years in the making, and uh, I won't belabor that point if uh, you being the good historians and good students you are uh, and have to be in order to become the good historians you are. You, you did your homework. Uh, you listened to the video. You know some of the background on how and why we're here, but let's talk about this big charge and the number 250, uh, the, the somewhat big number right there. Um, it, it occurred to us as we began thinking through this project that the nation had a very important birthday coming up in 2026. And uh, we also knew that history really, really matters, not just us because we're historians, but because uh, it both uh, helps us understand the past, but really uh, shape and reflect on the uh, present and define the future. And so our charge with this 250 was to say, what if we were to take these really cool tools that our colleagues at New American History are producing, which we're gonna talk about here now during the workshop and get you to think about and applying in your courses and put them out there, no cost to you as a, uh, as a faculty member, as an instructor, and look to redesign 250 courses, enrolling potentially 25,000 students by the nation's 250th birthday. Now on one level, it seems like a big audacious goal. On another level, we might find out it's not audacious enough and then we will let out some more zeros. But right now we're thrilled to have you here and I'm gonna turn it over to Ed in a moment because you're the vanguard, you're the first group. Uh, interestingly, you're about 25 people. So you're one tenth of the goal we need here. Uh, and, and as the August vanguard group, um, we'll, we'll look to you, we'll learn from you uh, we'll acknowledge that we're learning as we're going with you, and uh, we, we hope to uh, help you uh, think about and then actually apply these tools to transform your course as part of this 250. With that shared, I'll turn it over to Ed. And I will speak briefly since, uh, since you've done your homework, you've heard and seen enough of me. I'm sorry for being in your face on the uh, video that we made. Uh, you may recognize me better if I get closer to you. <laughs> um, it, it was early in the crisis. I'm sure I would do better now. Um, the whole point of this is 
all Americans take American history and, and often multiple times. The students that you're teaching in the community college are probably the last time people, they will, you'll have a chance to study American history. So after I finished you know, my deanship and the presidency, and I thought, what do I really care about now? What really, really matters is that with so many people taking American history, if we can make it somewhat better, if we can make it somewhat more engaging, if we can actually leverage all the capacity of all this internet and stuff to actually give tools to teachers who already know how to use them. All this is based, everything that we're doing is based on the fact that you know what you're doing. It's all based on the idea that we have faith in teachers and in students. And if we gave ways for uh, history to be more nimble, more energetic, but Teachers wouldn't have to invent all that every time from their own, but they can shape it. So that's what underlies all of these ideas of Backstory, the podcast, Future of America's Past, the video, American Panorama, the digital atlas, and Bunk, the real-time curation of all the ambient history, we call it, around us. And uh, so that's why we keep expressing our excitement about this, because the idea is that you will know ways to use this that we've not imagined. And that's what I look forward to learning about. Thanks very much. Wonderful, thank you, Drew and Ed. So I'm going to shift gears and think about the word that uh, Ed Ayers just said in terms of shaping and shaping our experiences for our students. And at the Gardner Institute and in the Teaching Learning Academy, this is a model that we follow for shaping the experiences that we want for students and shaping or designing courses that are relevant and meaningful for, for, for our students. So I'm just going to talk through this model briefly. Some of you might be familiar with it if you're able to join us at uh, the Teaching and Learning Academy last year. Um, this is a model put together by my colleague Steph Foote who's also on the call. So Steph, please jump in if I miss something. But the model is really an iterative model. So it's thinking about what our goals are for our students and how we're going to shape those goals um, into a, in a learning experience. And, but we also are relying not just on our experience and our discipline, but also we're thinking about our institution, the students that we have in our classrooms, um, departmental expectations. So there are a lot of factors and situational factors that we wanna consider when we're thinking about designing courses or design, designing assignments for our history courses. And then also in the Teaching and Learning Academy, when we think about our goals and have conversations about what we're trying to do and how we want to connect to our discipline, and in this case, history, usually we're in a large conference room, ballroom in a hotel with people from all disciplines. So this is a real um, treat to talk to one disciplinary audience um, in this workshop. So after we talk about the goals, thinking about historical thinking, thinking about um, what Ed Ayers discussed in the, his video around contextualization, contingencies, causation, um, then thinking about what are the, what's the evidence behind how students learn, behind how students learn in history courses, what are the resources that we have available to us to help shape those experiences. And then we encourage you to leave Teaching and Learning Academy, but then and then implement that plan and thinking about okay, in the next semester, this is what I'm this is what I plan to do, and this is how I plan to do things differently based on what I learned, um, and and what I learned from others, what I learned and what I learned at the Teaching and Learning Academy. And then the idea is to evaluate what happened, maybe have discussions in your department with other colleagues, um, think about what you would do next time, and then keep going. So it's so we're asking you to engage in a process of reflection and intentionality and thinking about what we can accomplish for our students in equitable ways and thinking about how to help them succeed in these courses. And not just in the course, but in all of their courses. And in this webinar, we're thinking about these first two steps of that model. Um, I will pause and just ask Steph if she would like to um, add anything to what I've said. No, you've done a brilliant job, Susanna. I don't think I have anything to add. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I, we also have, um, there's a QA button in this Zoom. So if you have questions, please go ahead and type your question in the QA entry and it uh, will pop up somewhere and hopefully somebody will tell me about it <laughs> because I can, can't see it at the moment. 
Um, but today we want to think about our discussions that we're going to have with each other. We want to think about the goals. And so these are the questions that we asked at Teaching and Learning Academy last year. So thinking about, and for those of you who were there, um, we asked you to think about your foundational knowledge that you want for students, so the content. So we're not asking you to sacrifice content because that's central to our courses, but we're thinking about what's really the foundational knowledge you want students to learn. And then what are the habits of mind or thinking skills or skills that you want students to develop that connect to those, um, to connect to that content. And then thinking about the resources that'll support students to develop those goals and develop those skills. Um, and in particular, we're talking about the resources in front of us. Um, and what I loved about the, the way that Edir talks about these different opportunities and resources that we have in these tools is that he, he described them as um, contextualization machines. And I think that's such a great way to think about these resources that provide multiple perspectives for our students, but multiple points of entry to think about history and different perspectives and different ways and hear about history in podcasts or look at a film or, or read some text. And so we wanted to talk through um, and give you an idea of what's possible with some of these tools th um, through an example from a colleague of, our, of ours, Laura Westhoff. And so Peter is going to talk through the use of these tools in relation to a particular writing assignment. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk about the way I might adapt Laura Westhoff's assignment. Um, Laura's assignment wasn't developed using American Panorama or Bunk. It's just a really good, thoughtful assignment that recognizes that in introductory history courses and gateway history courses, students often struggle both with the historical thinking and historical reasoning skills and with knowledge and also, so both, and a third thing too, um, also just writing skills, the reading and writing skills they need. And so the insight that I love from Laura's assignment that I've adapted is to really develop, help students develop those skills over a period of the whole course. So not just doing one assignment and then doing it over and doing it over, but building the pieces of those skills as the students go. And so in, um, in adapting Laura's assignment, what I was thinking about is a course I teach here. Um, you might know it from back in the day as you, you know, US history survey, but we call it contested democracy, the US from 1865. And in that course, one of the things I'm trying to do is get my students to think about how immigration patterns have changed and how American society has changed because of immigration and in relation to immigration. And so fortunately, when I was browsing around the new American history tools, um, Susanna, I'm gonna be, um, since you're clicking, I'm gonna say beep. So it's like a old school thing. Um, there's this wonderful, in American Panorama, there's this wonderful, rich um, resource called the Foreign Born Population, where you can actually go in to, you can go into individual counties. And so you could have students, and I have played with having students go into their home county where they're from and look at foreign born population and all this. But adapting Laura's assignment, it's, it's more sophisticated than that. Um, it's a four part assignment that I would use across multiple weeks of a semester. And so here we go. I think I can control this, let's see. And I can't control it, Susanna, so you're going to have to click. So in this four-part assignment, what I'm really trying to, oops, what I'm trying to do is four th or three things, but it's really, it's really one big goal. It's just broken down into three little bits. One is, again, it helps students learn to make historical arguments, to challenge them to think historically, to do that based on primary sources, because um, that's really um, what I think a core skill in intro history courses I want my students to learn and then to practice their writing skills as they're doing it because often that's one of the challenges. Sometimes they're good at historical thinking and they're not that great at writing and sometimes they're good at writing and not that great at historical thinking. So I want to tease these things apart. So the four parts here are adapted from Laura again and the first thing I have them do is in class um, remember back in the good old days when we had face-to-face -face classes? You could do it remotely, but I would do it in class. Get students into small groups and have them 
and let them play around with the foreign born population, assigning them or letting them pick a particular county that their group is gonna look at and have them look and analyze that county using this data from 1870, 1920, and 1970. And then based on their analysis, have them draft three different thesis statements. And how I do this in my classes, I have them then email me those thesis statements during class and I will share them with the class and we'll talk about both what their analysis is saying and how they're writing a thesis statement, right? So we get a sense of what a good strong thesis statement is. We get a, a sense of what a not so good strong thesis statement is. Um, and we also help play with the idea that there's lots of different ways you could analyze this and come up with different arguments, even from the same data source, right? So that's just a first activity. Everybody is building some confidence in their thesis writing. Second activity is an individual assignment. You can see it here, where I ask them to write basically a thesis and an intro paragraph and to identify some evidence they're gonna use based on a different county, right? So they're developing their skills. They're going from small group to individual. And then, and that I grade very, very lightly. That's sort of a credit, no credit thing with a little bit of feedback because I have a lot of students. The third step in this assignment is an individual assignment. This is Laura's key insight, I think. What she does and what I've adapted with brand new students is I give them two different thesis statements and short intro paragraphs that I've written that make different arguments and then ask them to develop out the complete essay using evidence they find, right? I, again, I grade that lightly. It's not entirely original work, but I, um, I also tend to have them do peer feedback on that to get better. And then finally, when it's exam time, I give them a take-home essay that looks like my take-home essays always do and ask them to write an essay and it's much broader question. They can pick any of the evidence, any of the counties they wanna do. They can draw on things they learned from their peers or from our conversations. But I hope what you see with this is students are learning and getting practice making historical arguments using different primary sources from this one foreign born population data set and also practicing different writing skills discreetly and getting feedback on their writing skills. So by the time they take their first seriously graded piece of work, this is not the first time they've thought about writing a clear thesis statement connecting that thesis statement to evidence. They've actually had practice doing that first. It leads many more of my students to be successful and leads my stronger students to be much more successful than they would be before. Now, we are going to shift in a minute into small groups to talk through how you might use some of these resources. But before we do that, I'm just curious back to what Suzanne had said about question and answers and things like this. Are there, are there in chats or in the Q&A function, um, does anybody have any questions or suggestions or concerns related to this assignment? It's not meant to be the perfect assignment or the only assignment, just a concrete illustration of a way I have adapted this kind of work into my own teaching. So I'll just pause for a minute, see if there's questions. Here we go. Uh, this is from James Schaefer. I take it these were questions asked in a big lecture hall. They, they certainly could be. I mean, you could do the same sort of thing in, a, I think, in a small seminar, too. My, stu my classes tend to have 30 students in them, so not gigantic lecture hall. Mm -hmm. But part of the, um, part of what I like about the way Laura has framed this, and honestly, the way it works when I've adapted it, is the first three steps don't require me to give, spend huge amounts of time giving individualized feedback to students. So students are getting quite a lot of practice thinking and writing without me investing a ton of time in one-on-one -on -one feedback for all 30 of my students. I've also seen this done in a, in a large lecture hall with 450 students with the instructor using something like Poll Everywhere, where it was uh, only around the thesis statement. So looking at sample thesis statements and asking students to respond in Poll Everywhere to uh, 
uh, evaluate those thesis statements. Um, and then he would talk about um, why they evaluated, then they would do a think pair share and talk it through. And then he would provide some summary about the positive aspects of that statement and then other things to think about as you're crafting thesis statements. Um, so, I, so that again was back in the day when we were together, but um, we could approach it either using Zoom and small group activities or also through Poll Everywhere or some other type of polling function. There's actually a polling function in Zoom that works well and you can set up those polls ahead of time. Yeah, so there's some questions that have come in. And um, first, I have to say hi to Nancy Young, who's an old mm -hmm. grad school friend of mine from the past millennium. So nice to see you remotely. Um, I'd also, this, could, sorry, Peter, just, okay. um, to, and also Tamika Meeks, I just wanted to say that she didn't have a question, but she also in, in embeds a lot of scaffolding in her courses. So thank mm -hmm. you, Tamika. Yeah. So a couple of questions about when do I do this in a semester and how. Mm -hmm. I would typically do this in three or four weeks near the end of the semester because the time frame I'm trying to get towards sort of comprehensive looks. So my class tends to build in units and then each unit we do a little bit of sort of thinking back across, but as I get closer to the end, it's much more thinking back across. You could do a variation on this, let's say just looking between 1870 and 1920 in the same county, you know, if it were in the first unit, but I'd use this near the last. I tend to stack these things fairly tightly together so students see the connections. So we're doing this exercise and then, you know, next class or next week, we're doing the next exercise. Um, let's see, do I have other assignments like this for comparable topics? I do. Um, I'm not going to yammer on too much about this. And, um, but I, I, I try to do as much of this sort of stacking assignments as possible because it helps my students, it helps build their skills, but also their confidence that they're going to be able to be successful doing this because they're trying things out with peers and then trying them out individually at first. Um, what kinds of sources? You know, I, I was raised doing this with paper sources and all this, but now um, because there's really strong tools and not just because the New American History people are here, but um, the New American people, History people are here, um, there's really great stuff. But, you know, you could go back to old Ed Ayers and do Valley of the Shadow. There's Library of Congress. There's National Archives. There's tons of different resources that you can embed into a course management system or other or other things. And my students often can access this kind of thing on a phone or most of my students have laptops. Um, and it, when I start with small groups, I, I tend to do these kinds of activities, not to get too geeky, but I tend to do these kinds of activities as small groups in my classes partly so that way if one student doesn't have a laptop, the students can share because it's easier for them to look on to one laptop anyway. So a group of three or four and all I need is to make sure one student in the group has a laptop. I hope that gets to some of the concrete questions. Uh, how many weeks is this four-part assignment? Um, I would do it usually over two and a half to three weeks. Um, well, the take-home exam, I usually give them a week. So I would be, you know, step four mm -hmm. would be the start of when I give the take-home exam, right? So that they've done all the prep work and feel good about starting the take-home exam. I wouldn't, I wouldn't overlap it there. Um, Tamika had a question about um, in upper division courses. You know, I, I think I tend to adapt things that work. So um, I think a lot of good teaching is borrowed from other wise people um, or from other classes. And so if something like this seems like it works, I would adapt it in upper level classes. I find often in my, even when I'm teaching a senior seminar, I will do some sort of thesis writing or thesis critique exercise in the first week or so, because um, I mean, one of the things I've learned about writing a long, long time ago is it can always get better. And I say that to my students. So even if they're very proficient at thesis writing and intro writing or short essay writing, um, just because they're seniors doesn't mean they've completely got their heads around every perfect way to do it. So um, we, I. In almost all my classes early in the semester, I have students send me thesis examples that we can critique together. And just to be clear, I tend not to critique them. I put them up on a slide or up on the screen, and the students are much more harsh than I am about how good those thesis statements are. So I just stand back and marvel, usually. And they say, that one doesn't have a point. You can't can make an argument like that, et cetera. And then I sort of defend the thesis maker. 
Great. I think it is that idea of practice that you were talking about in this example is important and that it's it's never done. I mean, just because you're a freshman who might have worked on this in one class doesn't mean that we can't keep working on it in other classes. Um, and from what I've seen working with students at the university level, um, they often talk about how, say they are in a research methods class and all of a sudden they, they feel as though they forgot everything they just learned in, a, in the previous three years. So I think there's room for practice and but also, as Tamika mentioned, this idea of scaffolding these assignments in careful ways that incorporate resources, give students a chance to practice and, and then show what they're practicing to others. Okay. So at this point, we're going, this is where I ask for uh, patience and good humor as we move into the breakout rooms. We have a question here to think about how some of the resources that we send in advance might uh, support um, and enhance your courses and your course designs. Um, okay, so we have couple different things going on. We have the slide here. So what we're asking for is to, there's a link in the chat that Ethan has posted. Uh, we're going to a separate Zoom room into our breakout rooms and we're going to have smaller conversations and answer some more of these questions and then we'll come back into a larger breakout room and, and talk about the good ideas generated. So you can either go to the link or you can um, link, go to zoom.us and type in the meeting ID number. Any other instructions, Ethan? Uh, that's it. I'm gonna give people about 30 seconds here. This okay. meeting will collapse um, and then the other meeting will be activated. So if you get there before we do, just give a few seconds of patience. If you're having trouble copying and pasting the link or you're still confused, uh, feel free to type in the chat here before we close this down. <laughs> <laughs> 